Hello and welcome to A Murderous Affair, the podcast where I talk about women in history known for mayhem and murder. My name is Gabrielle and this week's murderess is Sharon Kin, also known as La Pistolera. Oh, blah, blah, blah. My Spanish is not as good as I want it to be. La Pistolera. Yeah, I have a really, really bad accent. Sharon currently holds the longest standing felony warrant in the United States. So just a warning for those of you guys who like those clear cut endings, this has a very ambiguous one, but let's get started. First things first are resources. So a lot of the resources that I got were actual newspaper articles that were scanned into the Google News archives. So we have an article from the Lawrence Journal World, an article from the Reading Eagle, an article from the Altus Times Democrats, an article from St. Joseph's Press, and another article from St. Joseph Gazette, as well as the Nevada Daily Mail. I think my favorite article, though, is from the Reading Eagle. It's called, Was She a Murderess of the Year? Did the Midwest sex pot make love the lethal way with a bullet? I swear to you, old-timey 60s journalism had the best, 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 best news headlines in the world. Ruth Reynolds wrote this article, and it was published on February 27th, 1966. The article itself is a joy. If you guys have a chance, then definitely check out the Reading Eagle article on the Google News archives. Basically, if you go to Google News and search Sharon Kin in the archives, a bunch of articles come up and they're all fascinating to read. So, who is Sharon Kin? Well, she was originally born Sharon Elizabeth Hall and is also known not only as La Pistolera, but as Jeanette Puglis, which was an alias she used to visit Mexico with. Like I said, she currently holds the longest standing felony warrant in the United States, as well as the longest standing arrest warrant in Missouri. Sharon was born on November 30th, 1939 in Independence, Missouri. Her parents were Eugene and Doris Hall, and she seemed to have had a pretty average life growing up. She met her would-be first husband when she was 16 and he was 22, James Kin. They met through a church function and dated over the summer of 1956 before James had to return to BYU for college. They continued to talk throughout the year, and according to those who knew her, she was looking for a way to escape Independence, Missouri. Eventually, she wrote James a letter saying that she was pregnant with his baby and they got married on October 18th, 1956. They actually had another more formal wedding the following year at the Salt Lake Temple once Sharon had completed the process of becoming Mormon. After their wedding, they moved to Provo, Utah, where James went to finish school at BYU. But that didn't last long. They decided to move back to Independence at the end of the fall semester. James worked as an electrical engineer and Sharon worked odd jobs as a babysitter and part-time in retail. Now, she claimed to have miscarried the child she'd been pregnant with at the beginning of their marriage, but she was soon pregnant again, and her first child was born soon after moving back to Independence. Her daughter's name was Dana. Sharon had a habit of spending money that she didn't have. She would buy the nicest and most expensive things that she felt she deserved. They rented a house near James's parents at first, and then they moved to a ranch house they had built once they got more settled. James ended up working the night shift and Sharon found some extracurriculars to fill her time with after she'd had their second child, Troy. Mainly, a friend from high school named John Boldizes. Their marriage began to show cracks in the early 1960s. James wanted to a divorce and he talked about this to his parents on March 18th. He told them that Sharon had agreed to a divorce if he let her keep the house, their daughter, and a thousand dollars. And it seems like Sharon wanted out of the marriage too. Apparently, she'd offered Boldizas a thousand dollars to either kill her husband or find someone to kill him for her. But of course, this was just a joke, obviously. And then, on March 19th, according to Sharon, at 5.30 p.m., she heard a gunshot from the bedroom where James was sleeping. She had been, quote, making herself pretty for the night in the bathroom before going to wake her husband for his evening shift. When she went to the room, she saw their two and a half daughter on the bed next to her husband, holding a gun to the back of his head. James was bleeding and he was rushed to the hospital, but died on the way there. No fingerprints were found on the gun and there wasn't a gunshot residue test done on their daughter or Sharon. Apparently, and this was co actually confirmed by friends, neighbors, and family, 
James would let the two-year-old play with his guns. Now, I would hope that he had more, more common sense than to let a baby play with loaded guns, but this was the 60s, so who knows. The police tested this claim with an unloaded gun and saw that Dana was actually able to pull the trigger while playing around with it. So ultimately, it was ruled as an accidental death, although a very suspicious one. The police confiscated the gun that killed James, even though Sharon apparently wanted it back. When they refused, she had a male co-worker of hers buy her a 22 automatic pistol and register it in a name other than her own. After the investigation ended, Sharon collected James's life insurance policy of $29,000. In today's money, that would be around $230,000. And James's parents continued to completely support her. Her in-laws refused to hear anything negative about the woman who had birthed their grandchildren and made themselves helpful in any way possible for the 20-year-old who, quote, had so much of her life taken away from her in such a short time. And I, I definitely, this is just um, my own thoughts at this point, but I definitely understand like the need to believe that she was innocent because she's like the mother of your grandchildren, you know? And you don't want to believe that this would be the woman who was capable of doing that. But overall, it was very suspicious. So I'm wondering if they just presented as a united front. Total speculation, not anything journalistic at all, but just my own wonderings and opinion. So Sharon used some of this money to buy a Ford Thunderbird, which is where she met Walter Jones, a man she viewed as her prospective second husband. However, he had a little problem in which that he was already married to a woman named Patricia Jones. They'd been married for five years when Walter met Sharon on April 18th, almost a month exactly after her husband's death. They soon began to have an affair. In May, Sharon invited him on a trip with her to Washington, but Walter refused and Sharon went with her brother instead. When she came back from the trip, she had some news for Walter. She was pregnant and he was the father. However, instead of agreeing to divorce Patricia, he broke up with Sharon instead, which was not what she expected. On May 26th, Sharon called Patricia at her office and told her that Walter was having an affair, not with herself, but with Sharon's sister. They agreed to meet and then supposedly Sharon dropped her off after their meeting near the Jones house. But Patricia never made it home. Walter filed a missing persons report and started calling people to see if they knew what had happened to her. He got a hold of her work carpool group and got a lead there. See, her carpool co-workers told Walter that Patricia had gotten a strange call at work and had asked to be dropped off on a street corner to meet with an unnamed woman. This co-worker then described what they had seen of this woman before leaving, and that description was enough to make Walter call Sharon. She admitted to having called Patricia and to meeting up with her, but insisted that she had dropped her off near her home. Walter and Sharon met in person, where he tried to force more details out of her about meeting with his wife, because he was really suspicious, and pretty rightfully so. After their meeting ended, Sharon decided to call her high school friend Boldizas again and asked him to help her look for Patricia. Now this all comes from her statement of what happened, so take that with a grain of salt. They go to look for Patricia and, surprise surprise, find a body that matches the description of Patricia Jones in a black sweater and a yellow skirt. It turns out that the area she was found in was a spot that Boldizas and Sharon had gone to for dates before, and Boldizas claimed that he was the one who actually saw the body, not Sharon. Patricia had been shot four times by a 22 pistol. On the 28th, Sharon, Boldizas, and Walter were all brought in for questioning. Both Walter and Boldizas admitted to having a relationship of some sort with Sharon and agreed to take a polygraph test as well as give written and oral statements. Sharon agreed to give an oral statement but declined to give a written one or to be considered for a polygraph. And I know that we all know now that polygraphs aren't the end-all be-all of criminal investigations, but you still look pretty guilty, Sharon. Denying the polygraph doesn't help you. Or maybe it did, because, well, we'll get to that in a minute. The crime scene was also investigated and the police used Boy Scouts to help search the dirt for possible bullets. The 60s are astounding. Eventually, a bullet shell for a 22 caliber was found in the dirt where Patricia's body had been. 
but the murder weapon wasn't found there or in any nearby bodies of water, even though those places had been dragged to search. Patricia's funeral was on May 31st, and Sharon was arrested around 11 p.m. the same day. Now, I don't think that came to a shock to anyone, but what did come as a shock was that in addition for the charges against her for possibly murdering Patricia, there was also charges that were being brought against her for the murder of James Kinn. See, investigators had spent the past year and a half searching for any kind of clue or insight that she had been involved in James's murder, but they hadn't really found anything except for this circumstantial evidence and the fact that she was now suspected in another murder. While out on bail of $24,000, which as of 2013 was almost $200,000 in today's money, Sharon gave birth to a daughter named Marla Christine on January 16th, 1961. Sharon's first trial began in mid-June. The prosecution focused on the fact that Sharon would have had motive due to being pregnant and Walter not leaving his wife for her, as well as having had someone else buy her a gun that was the same make and model as the one used during the murder. The defense mainly focused on poking loopholes and testimonies given and testifying that other than ju just happening to own the same type of gun as the one that killed Patricia, there wasn't any solid evidence to prove she was guilty. And after an hour and a half deliberation by an all-male jury, she was acquitted. An hour and a half. That's all it took. Her first trial led to her being acquitted of Patricia Jones's murder, but her second trial was soon to begin for her suspicion in James Kinn's murder. In this second trial, she would originally be found guilty, but there was so much public backlash on the circumstantial evidence, on the fact that James's own parents were the ones saying that she was innocent, and along with clerical errors that showed that the jury had actually deadlocked three times, the previous verdict was reversed, and a new trial for the murder of James Kinn began. The second trial begins in 1964, only to be declared a mistrial because there was a conflict of interest among the jurors. Apparently one of them had been represented by a prosecutor before and therefore it was a conflict of interest. Then began the third trial in 1964, which had a very, very interesting outburst when it came to an old cellmate who came to testify while Sharon had been held in the county jail waiting for trial. Apparently, the cellmate told how Sharon described killing her husband. And Sharon, at this point, not only shouted from her seat at the council table, lies, 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 but also went to the witness stand to declare that her ex-cellmate had been lying. Apparently, she was really convincing, but so was the ex-cellmate. This led to a deadlock trial and a third trial for the murder of James Kinn was scheduled for October of 1964. Now, Sharon was out for good behavior at this time because really she hadn't been found guilty of murder, you know? So she was out on bail. This is one of the reasons why I loved that article I mentioned before um, because in their paragraph when they talked about how Sharon was out on bail for good behavior, they say, now, if you will count on your fingers, you will see that Miss Kin had been free on bail and good behavior for about 15 months. A long time for a swinger to remain inactive. Oh my gosh. And I'm pulling from the article here because I just love reading it and I feel like everyone should enjoy it. So Sharon met up with Samuel Frank Francis Puglius, I don't know how, P-U-G-L-I-E-S-E, -E, who was 35 and in the article's words, a drifter, a talker, a hairdresser, and an ex-burglar. By September, she was mad about him, or at least eager to take a little vacation with him before getting back to the dull routine of that fifth murder trial set for October 1964. Yes, to Mexico they would go. And they ended up going to Mexico in September. It's also suspected that they went to Mexico to get married. And this is where she traveled as Jeanette Puglias. Uh, saying that she was this Frank guy's wife. They checked into a hotel and Sharon said that she didn't feel safe in a foreign country, so she had brought her own gun with her to help keep her safe. This was in addition to the two guns that Pugliese had brought with him. On September 18th, 1964, Sharon went out, either to get more money, as she and Pugliese were running low, or to get medicine for herself. There's been different statements depending on who you ask. She ended up meeting a man named Francisco Paredes Ordonez at a bar. He was a 35-year-old American citizen who was currently in Mexico. 
Now, she met him on her way to either get money or medicine. And then he offered her a ride back to her hotel room, which she accepted. At this point, he was, according to Sharon, making sexual advances towards her that made her uncomfortable. And so she shot him in the chest and he died. A hotel worker, Enrique Martinez Herrera, came to see what was going on, and she also shot him, too. Luckily, just in the arm, so he was able to lock her inside the hotel room and call the police. Now, she told her story to the police when they showed up, but surprisingly for Sharon, they weren't inclined to believe her story. Instead, their theory was that she had tried to rob Francisco, and when he refused to give her the money, she shot him. They arrested her on charges of assault with a deadly weapon and homicide. Sharon insisted that she had not meant to hurt Francisco or Enrique. She'd only shot them because she thought that they were going to attack her. So when police searched her purse, they found 50 shells and the gun. They then went back to the hotel room that she and Pugliese were were sharing and found two more guns and more shells. Now, here's the part that's probably going to piss a lot of people off. One of those guns was proven through ballistics to be the same gun that murdered Patricia Jones in 1960. And this is the awful part. Because she had already been acquitted for that crime, she couldn't be charged for it again based on that new evidence. Even though she was clearly in possession and had been in possession for a long time of the gun that killed Patricia Jones. Unless somehow this new guy that she was with had also managed to kill her, but I think we all understand the statistical improbability of that happening. Both Sharon and her new lover were arrested. Her lover was deported, but Sharon was actually placed in a women's prison before being transferred to Lecumberri for her trial. She was convicted on October 18th for Francisco's murder and sentenced to a 10-year prison sentence. Obviously, she thought this was unfair, so she tried to appeal her sentence. And when it was brought to the superior court, they said that her original sentence had actually been too lenient. So it went from 10 years to 13 years. So take that, Sharon. After having her sentence lengthened, she went back to the woman's prison. I'm, oh, I wish I knew Spanish. At Ixtapalapan, where she was named La Pistolera, or the gunfighter. Just when we thought we'd got some justice, I told you guys this is not going to be a satisfying ending for anyone. On December 7th, 1969, Sharon didn't show up for a 5 p.m. roll call at the prison. When she failed to show up again for a second roll call that night, her absence was officially noted. However, the news of her possible escape wasn't reported to Mexico City Police until 2 a.m. That's when the manhunt was organized. This manhunt originally started in the northern Mexico states as well as transport hubs. The FBI and other U.S. officials were alerted that she may be trying to get back into the U.S., but the FBI told Mexican authorities that most likely it was out of their jurisdiction. There were tons of theories as to how she could have escaped. The most prevalent, and honestly the one that probably holds the most significance, is that she had bribed the guards into letting her do it, as there had been an unusual blackout at the time they estimated her escape, as well as a door being unsecured that was normally locked. It also doesn't help that this prison in general is pretty lax and understaffed, which may have been why her escape went unnoticed for so long. There were some other conspiracy theories, like the fact that Francisco's family had offered to help her escape, only to murder her later. There was the idea that she had been dating someone who was a Mexico City policeman who had orchestrated the escape, and theories as to the fact that her own mother was somehow in part of it. None of those have been substantiated. A lot of people tend to believe the fact that Francisco's family were the ones to help her escape, and then murder her because that way they can get revenge. But once again, there's no proof to support this. Despite assuring the public that they would not stop until Sharon was in custody, by the end of December 1969, authorities had run out of leads. So barely, like not even two weeks, barely two weeks later, the authorities had no leads to run on. They had no idea and no hope of starting to find her. The authorities believed that she had already crossed the border from Mexico to Guatemala. They said that at this point, she was nearly fluent in Spanish from spending so long in the country and can get along well in almost any Spanish-speaking area in the world. More than 40 years after her escape, Sharon Kin still remains at large. If she were to be found, she'd be 80 years old. And that 
is the story of La Pistolera, Sharon Kin. This story is so, so just full of surprises and it's definitely one that's interesting to know about. And I love the fact that there are so many articles that were being written at this time because of how it fascinated the United States. But I just wish that there was more information on what the Mexico City Police had been doing to find this woman, and, you know, and that the manhunt went on longer than two weeks. Because it's really unfortunate that there are families out there who won't get any kind of justice for what Sharon did or was suspected of doing. But I enjoyed telling you guys this story. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below of wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on Libsyn, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or reach out to me on social media and let me know what your thoughts are. You can find me at Frumius Reads, F-R-U-M-I-O-U-S-R-E-A-D-S, on Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, YouTube, basically everywhere. I try and upload episodes weekly, but lately it's been more like twice a month. Just know that you get to hear anywhere between two to four stories a month on murderous women in history that often a lot of people don't know, know about from all over the world. If you want to help support the podcast, check out our merchandise at frumiusreads.com forward slash shop. You can buy one of two shirt designs that honestly are super cool and really comfortable. I wear mine all the time and not just because I'm trying to find free ways of promotion. But if you like the podcast, that definitely helps out. Uh, my air condition just kicked on because it's 110 outside. Ugh. So I'll end this episode quickly. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy the story. Stay spooky, friends. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. Oh, I was about to be... Okay, sorry. Real quick. I looked and my recording like didn't show up for a second. And I was going to be so pissed if I just if I had just spent the last 40 minutes talking and it did not record. Oh my gosh, I just had a mini heart attack. Okay, that's all. I gotta go now. This is stressing me out. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. Bye.